now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Crime drama this hour, William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Episode originally broadcast March 1st, 1953, and the episode entitled, Behold, a Corpse. Bromo Seltzer and NBC present William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. <laughs> There's a familiar saying which goes, uh, give a rogue enough rope and he'll hang himself. The theory holds fine, except in one instance. What if the chap doling out the rope happens to be the hangman? Bromo Seltzer, famous for fast relief of headache and upset stomach, and the National Broadcasting Company present... William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. A confidential investigator isn't always hired on his merits. His merits is a fact finder, I mean. Some clients choose you because they hope you're stupid. They don't want a cop. They want a stooge. You ought to be the front behind which they can keep a criminal operation going. You're the rubber stamp certifying their sincerity so they can get away with murder. Yeah, you get them like that. Cases phony from the word go. That was my first hunch on Brenda Connor, a brunette with a tendency to overact. We launched her case in Central Park. In a handsome carriage, complete with horse, silk-hatted driver, and lap robe. Around the park at three dollars an hour. But I wasn't paying the tab. The lady was. Why the handsome cab and the freezing weather? I didn't ask. You get used to eccentrics. The rhythmic slippity clop. I'm able to think. So who's the demon? Demon? The demon pursuing you. You have a flippant way, Mr. Craig. To cover up my emotions. I'm the type who identifies. A sad lady like you, I can cry harder than any little white cloud around. You were about to tell me. It's my husband. Funny now how it always is. Ralph Connery. He was gone for five years, completely out of my life. A long wait for a streetcar. I'd almost forgotten him. And then one week ago, he came back to me. And you resent his return. I didn't say that. That's right, you didn't. But you don't look overjoyed. No, but but it isn't what you think. I have no basic quarrel with my marriage, even despite the separation, but... Throw the punchline. Ralph, this man who is my husband come back. I'm not so sure that it is he. I let Brenda Connor continue to unburden her soul over coffee. The tab was on me this time. How much coffee could a lady drink? My alarm's about my husband, Ralph. Yes? I, I don't mean to leave the impression with you that... That uh, you're sure he's an impersonator? Yes. My reaction to him since his return, my suspicions have been intuitive more than actual. I, I feel I, I don't know. My husband takes off for five years and then suddenly he's back. How did you receive him? Well, gladly enough at first. You asked him questions? Yes. His explanation of his absence seemed genuine to me, understandable. He'd been out of sorts with himself. Suddenly, 40 and restless, disoriented and neurotic, full of self-dislike, dissatisfaction with the career he'd chosen. Said career? Uh, realty management. Connor and Saxton. Saxton is his business partner. When did the doubt begin for you? The doubt, uh, intuitive as you call it, uh, that this voyager come back maybe wasn't really your husband. The very first evening, Ralph was different, a, a stranger I, I didn't know. After five years, he would be. Yes, yes, I know, but what I mean is the personality I once knew, the, the habits, the, 
the little things a wife knows about her husband. I could find none of them in, in this man. Little things. Uh, can you give me something specific? Yes. The, the foods Ralph liked, always liked. This man has very different tastes. And even his speech, his way of phrasing things, and his thoughts so, so different, so very changed. And even something physical. What's that? Left-handed. This man is left-handed. My husband, the husband I knew, wasn't. Quite a switch, then. How about his appearance, looks? Oh, there are some differences. Still differences that could only mean time, how time changes the face. Ralph was full in the cheeks. This man is gaunt, thinner. Oh, <laughs> mind you, I'm not saying... Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm confused. I'm so confused. I can't even speak straight, Mr. Craig. <laughs> for confusion. But there was more to it than the lady was telling. There always is. I got a peek into what was omitted in the telling. The time was later that same afternoon. It was raining bucket. I had my formal tie on for a ride over to see the husband, Ralph Connor, firsthand. The great thing about a jalopy, it either starts or it doesn't. Mine wouldn't. Wet wires from the downpour, I figured. But my guess was wrong. There was a gentleman on hand to correct me on it. We'll only run your battery down, Craig. Get off the starter. A guy in a rain slicker slouched in the back of my car. Nice eyes and an easy grin. And a familiar swell near the left armpit. I knew what that swell was. I had one myself to match it. A gun holster. The wires aren't wet, Craig. There's another reason she won't start. What's that? This. Here. Your rotor. Rotor? You don't know about cars? I know they go or don't go. The rotor belongs under the hood on the engine where the distributor is. I removed it. Why? So your car wouldn't go. Why again? So you'd bum a ride from me. Where are you, Pop? Right behind you. Come on, I'll show for you. You sound like you know where I'm going. Yeah, I think so. See Ralph Connor. You want to look him over? You're well informed. I took courses in mind routing. Come on, I'll drive you. To Ralph Connor this is? No, not right away. I've got something else to show you first. Are you stalling, Craig? No, I'm thinking. How about? The penalty for armed kidnapping. Twenty years. Life if you cross state lines. That's the Lindbergh law. And the chair if you compound kidnapping with murder. So what's it to be, Craig? I'd been grabbed at gunpoint before, but this one had a new wrinkle. No violence, no dent in my skull, no impulsive ride to the country. Just a short ride over to Queens, to a roadhouse you had to shove your way into. More people and floor space. A jam at the bar and a jam on the postage stamp dance floor. People laughing it up, people living it up. Look over the dance floor, you see something? Yeah, sweat and suffocation. No, I mean faces. For instance, over there, the brunette swooning all over the he-man in a plaid shirt. You see her? I see her. You know her? Brenda Connor, my client. Well, that ends my mission. So long, Craig. You're on your own now. Buster, wait. Yeah, Craig? The plaid shirt with my client. He's not Ralph Connor. <laughs> Married folks don't spend time here with each other. No, he's Chris Contura. He's a tennis player. A tennis player? Love matches in the hot afternoon sun and love matches under hot blue lights with slender ladies with fat checkbooks. Is this why you brought me here? To show you a two-timing wife so you discount half to 90% of what she told you. Look, uh, as long as we're talking... I've said all I want to. Uh, so you won't knock yourself out identifying me when I'm gone. Here's my card. So long again. The card he'd left with me read, Mike Hasek, private detective. The guy who'd put the polite snatch on me was a private eye. I switched my plans around. You do with new developments. I didn't try to interview Ralph Connor right off. I drove over to his residence to case the place. Pretty fancy. A townhouse all lit up like utility bills were no concern to anybody. There was a parlor floor drawing room that opened onto a stone balcony. I was enough of a gymnasium genius to make the balcony without setting up too much of a commotion. After ten minutes of eavesdropping on the 
rustle on thick oriental carpets, I got to listen to a live show. Brenda Connor and a guy I took to be her ever-loving mister on the other side of the glass. You've got that odd look again, Brenda. Look, Ralph? What odd look? The frail, pale princess in the grip of a nameless terror. Oh, you have been cruel deliberately. Deliberately? To unnerve me. Push me to the edge of reason. Push me... Beyond the edge? Into insanity, yes. I see. Now, suppose you try the shoe. I try the shoe? To see how it fits you. What's been your scheme with me? Scheme? I have no scheme. The terrified glances since my return, so nicely timed when company watches, so beautifully acted. And the way you contrived to look at me other times, the unfamiliar stares, if I were not your husband, but an interloper. Not an interloper, Ralph, but a... <laughs> yes, Brenda? An imposter. I see. <laughs> I am not who I am. Is that what you're saying? Oh, what about me is so changed? I'd like to know, Brenda. Everything has changed. Your manner, your talk, your, your habits, so many little things. And not like the Ralph I knew, the Ralph I remember. An imposter, that was your word. Do you then really think I am not Ralph Connor? That I am somebody else? Some diabolical somebody else playing at being Ralph Connor? I don't know. I don't know. It was time to get off the balcony and make a more formal entrance into the life of Ralph Connor through the front door. I started to do same when I had a mishap. Cute word, mishap. It can mean anything. It can mean a tear in your trousers from an unexpected nail. It could mean a ton of brass landing on your head. In my case, it meant the last mention. A ton of brass. <clears throat> it fell from a height, from upstairs somewhere with cannonball speed. What? Who? I was too sleepy to care. I just lay down. To Barry Craig in just a moment. March 1st, 1953, Barry Craig Confidential Investigator on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets? It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us. We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. That's 800-738-5332. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now more of Barry Craig Confidential Investigator, March 1st, 1953. One thing about consciousness, it always returns sooner or later. If you're not dead, that is. I wasn't. I had proof I wasn't. I could wiggle a finger. When you're dead, you can't. Rigor mortis won't allow it. I was on a couch with a guy slapping cold compresses on my forehead. A guy with nice eyes and an easy smile and wearing a rain slicker indoors. He was the private eye, Mike Hassick. Able to get up now, Craig? I'm up. What hit me? A flower pot, solid brass. It was on the window ledge three flights up. It fell? No. Oh. It was dropped on me. That's right. By whom? Me. You're working for the Mr. Ralph Connor? That's right. 
An impersonator. Stand in for the real article. If you want to believe a wacky two-timing wife. I see. Who owns all the loot in the family? So don't answer it. I can guess the way it shapes. My client, friend of Connor, does. Your client hasn't got a dime. That stuff about Ralph Connor being an impersonator is the malarkey, Craig. Maybe, but answer me this. Can a man who's been right-handed to the age of 40 suddenly turn up left-handed? But don't answer it, has it? Think about it while I'm busy somewhere else. You're going to heckle Connor? Maybe. Oh, uh, has he? What? Come here to the rear window a minute. Yes? What's outside? The yard. Yeah, it's a backyard. Not much of a drop. Only ten feet, I'd guess it to be. Ten feet? So what? So one of us has to be discouraged. You've had your whack at me. Now it's turnabout. Craig, let me go. Put me down. Put you down? Sure. Exactly what I intend doing. You meet some guys sometimes who have to be paid back in their own coin. I didn't set up a talk with Ralph Connor. I passed him up a second time. I had nothing to say to him yet. Instead, I looked up Saxton of Connor and Saxton Realty Management. Connor's business partner. Maybe he could shed some light. A short guy with two stomachs and pink ears like he was always blushing. There was an oily look to him, like he was an accomplished phony. I still don't quite understand the purpose of your call here to me, Mr. Craig. If you've stalled long enough, Saxton... If I've stalled? Worked out answers in your head. Well, I I have no ulterior motives in evading you. Then? Well, it's just that uh, I I don't care to become embroiled in the man's affairs. Uh, That is, his affairs other than our joint business. Frankly, I've always found Connor strange and unpredictable. Explosive. He was gone for five years. Yes. Did you keep his end of the business up for all that time? Oh, yes, scrupulously. His share of the net profits were put into an escrow account uh, for what they amounted to. His uh, drawing account, of course, was suspended while he was gone. In the time he was away, did he write to you, keep in touch? Uh, No. Now a big question. Is he Ralph Connor? Yes, Mr. Craig. You don't seem surprised at the question. No, no, I'm not surprised anymore. I've been asked the same question before. By whom? Two persons. By Mrs. Connor and by a private detective named Mike Hassick. So Hassick wasn't so sure of his client's identity either. Uh, What's that you said? Uh, Just thinking out loud. What makes you sure this new Connor is the same old Connor? Why, everything about him. Like? Like, uh... Well, um, I I don't know how to answer that quite. He he looks like Ralph Connor, facially and physically. He knows about me, our business, the the background of our business. He's demonstrated all that to you? Why, uh, yes, yes, of course. He has demonstrated an intimate knowledge of our business. It it couldn't be faked. Uh, The man simply had to know. Connor was Connor. Only thing, Saxton didn't sell me the notion convincingly enough. I double-checked on Saxton's truthfulness by applying some heat to the office bookkeeper of Connor and Saxton. Why, Mr. Saxton told you outrageous falsehoods. Outrageous! He didn't ring true to me too much. Good I got to you, Mr., uh, what's it again? Uh, Pippet. I'm the one to tell the truth. Oh, that's peachy dandy. But, uh, get around to telling it. Well, now, uh, Ralph Connor... Uh, the new one. He's a queer one. Meaning? Well, when he came back after being away all that time, he didn't know my name. He kept calling me Pippin and Poppin. Pippin and Poppin, mind you, when it's Pippin, like it's always been. Pretty staggering. And, and then about the business, he didn't know about the old Cameroon account. He didn't, huh? The, the, the biggest account in the Connor Saxton agency, and he didn't even seem to know he had it. Like this wasn't his business. What else? Well, uh, his easy way about money. Tipping me a dollar when he sent me out for coffee. The old Ralph Connor only tipped five cents. Is the new Ralph Connor also easy about money in other ways? Business ways, for instance. I, I, I don't know what you mean. I mean, like, not asking for an accounting from Saxton to cover the five years Connor was away. Well, then, there never was an accounting. And, and Mr. Connor never yet asked for one. Well, you'd know that. You're the bookkeeper. Oh, yes, yes. I'd be the one to know, all right. 
Is there an escrow account with Connor's share of the profits of the last five years in it? Oh, no, there's no escrow account. Well, were there any profits the last five years Connor's been away? Oh, yes, yes, good profits. Business has been very good. Uh, how good were the profits? Well, I, I couldn't say without going over the books. $50,000, is that close to it? It, it isn't far from it. Then a sharpie like Saxton would have reason to play ball with somebody not the real Connor, but an impersonator. Keep all the accumulated business profits, so long as the new Connor didn't stick his hand out or yell for the D.A. Oh, well, I'm afraid now you're getting too deep. Oh, yeah. forget it. Uh, you've been a great help. You can go back to your books now, Pippin. The name is not Pippin. Oh, my mistake, Poppin. It's Pippin. <laughs> It was time to form an independent impression of Ralph Connor, I figured. The townhouse sat next door to the East River. I'd just gotten to the doorbell when I found myself doing some more eavesdropping. Nothing subtle this time. Anybody for a mile around could eavesdrop along with me. A scream has carrying power. A high-pitched woman's scream. <coughs> Brenda Connor. I could identify the voice. Brenda Connor at home. Either being strangled to death or blowing her top. March 1st, 1953, Barry Craig, confidential investigator on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion follows these messages. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge, but it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch to the customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with, you can call Right now, and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox here on your favorite station. Now the conclusion of Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Behold a corpse, March 1st, 1953. Inside the house, I didn't get to see my screaming client. She was in her room behind locked doors. The husband, Ralph Connor, told me the melancholy facts. Or do I mean the melancholy fiction? Brenda is in there in her room with her doctor. Doctor who? Does that matter? It matters. I'm jotting it down in my notebook. Mrs. Connor is my client. Dr. Phipps. Uh, 275 Dartmouth Street, if you also want the address. Phipps is Brenda's own physician. I get your emphasis. When can I see Mrs. Connor? I don't know. She's under restraint. Restraints meaning? She's had a nervous breakdown. All of a sudden. No, my wife has a history of, uh, say, emotional instability. Hallucinations, compulsive behavior, a fascination for uh, unsavory places and people. That's a careful reference to the roadhouse and tennis, Adonis. Mike Hassock made sure I'd see. Yes, so that you'd be aware of all the facts. 
Uh, this emotional instability in Brenda, it's one of the reasons I left her five years ago. I've had all I could stand at Pistaria. You make a glib case of it. It's the truth. What happens to Brenda Connor from here on? Hospitalization. It's not the first time Brenda has been confined before. And cured? Evidently not, as this new breakdown shows. Comes a time she's declared mentally incompetent. Uh, who gets her money? That is an impertinent question. I'll answer it. You do. You step into her estate. I'll even bet you've already got the petition before the court with Dr. Phipps' affidavit pinned to it. I don't care to dignify this nonsense any longer, Mr. Craig. So if you don't mind, good night. On the street, I had an encounter with a guy who was making a habit of it. Stop a minute, Craig. What for, has it? A talk. Friendly talk. With a gun in my ribs? The gun's for my own protection. You play too hard. So do you. I have to. I'm in it for the cabbage, just like you. Speak only for yourself. <laughs> You'll change your mind. A hundred grand. We split it down the middle. Who gives it to us? Connor, if you don't spoil it for him. Keep talking. Connor is a phony, an impersonator, like you said. The real Connor, he probably knocked off somewhere, the way I figure it. But none of our business. Now... This Connor grabs the wife's estate. We let him. You let him. Then the bike. He pays us off. We own him. You're sure of your facts? I checked. I sized everything up. Connor's a fake, a smart fake, and a winner. Let's win with him, okay? Why did Connor hire you in the first place, Hasek? To follow his wife around, report on who she saw, spent time with, that tennis player. You? No, now tell me. Are you playing it smart along with me? What do you think? I think you are. Sure you are. <laughs> what have you got against money? I played it smart, the poor man's way. I didn't go home and let Connor play out his scheme. I went back to Connor for a closer look at his scheme. You've become a frequent visitor, Mr. Craig. <laughs> Every ten minutes, sir. I realized out on the street that I'd said things in here to you that were out of line. I'm sorry. Forget it. Thanks. I can see now what a screwball Mrs. Connor is and how I went for the bunk. Uh, the uh, only thing... Uh, yes, Mr. Craig. I'm a working operative. I put in time and sweat. Uh, I've had expenses. Oh, I see. You've got a bill and you're wondering how you're ever going to get paid. That's it. Uh, it's no obligation of yours, I know. Oh, nonsense. I'll pay Mrs. Connor's bill. In fact, I'll uh, make out a check right here and now. How much is it, Mr. Craig? Well, uh, 100 will about cover it. $100. Very well. Uh, here you are, Mr. Craig. A $100 check for you. It means more to me than you think, Mr. Connor. Oh, you don't have to thank me. The money's due you. <laughs> but I didn't mean it like that. Guess again, Connor. <laughs> I, I frankly don't understand you. I'll explain myself. You wrote out a check, and you also wrote out a confession. A confession? You're right-handed. You wrote that check out right-handed, like Ralph Connor should, since he was always right-handed. Look here, Craig. Let me finish. But you've been deliberately left-handed for Mrs. Connor's benefit since you came back to her. To confuse her about you, start her doubting your identity. See you as an imposter, but never be sure. Until she went out of her mind like she has. Would you? You can't prove a thin, Craig. All kinds of tricks like that. To play on her imagination. You thin down, change your known habits and clothes and foods, your style of talk. All to make an already unstable woman a screaming lunatic. Have her declared mentally incompetent so you could take control of her money and her estate. How big is the estate, Connor? Big, I judge it to be. No end of money. It has to be a fabulous grab to rate your fancy technique in crime. I say again, you can't prove a thing. Because you're really Ralph Connor, huh? And can prove it. Birth certificate, relatives stuck somewhere, fingerprints. That's what you're gambling on. Why you're so cocksure. You're immune, you figure. Win or lose, you can't lose. Since you're really not an impersonator, but the genuine article. Get your hat anyhow, Connor. My hat? Where are we going? To the district attorney's office to see what charge he can fit to your kind of cute scheme. Offhand, I'd say conspiracy. But what do you bet the DA finds a few more in the book? You've been 
listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Behold a Corpse, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled The Sinister Snowman, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I find that murder on skis is twice as romantic and deadly as murder on foot. When a skiing champion gets permanently stiff in the joints. Not so much from the cold weather as from the icy chill in a lady's eyes. Good night, folks. See you next week. Bromo Seltzer, famous for fast relief of headache and upset stomach, and the National Broadcasting Company have brought you Barry Craig, confidential investigator, starring William Gargan. Featured in the role of Brenda was Barbara Weeks. Carl Caruso speaking. From March 1st, 1953, Barry Craig, confidential investigator on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get pain magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, another episode of Captain Midnight, March 1st, 1940. The Skelly Oil Company presents Captain Midnight. Captain Midnight, brought to you three times each week by the Skelly Oil Company, Skelly Choppers and Dealers. And now to Captain Midnight. Chuck Ramsey and his friend, Frank Crane, you remember, are in the power of Ivan Shark, who is taking them on a secret flight. Meanwhile, Captain Midnight and his friends are doing all they can to get a clue as to Chuck's whereabouts. It is now noon on the day following Chuck's disappearance. Captain Midnight, Major Steele, and Steve Donovan are seated in the pilot's room of the Southwest Airlines Administration Building at Ridgeville Airport. They're gathered round a small table on which is spread out a large map. Listen as Major Steele says, Well, what are your plans, Captain? What do you want to do? Well, now, here's the way I look at it, Major. Shark's got a 24-hour start on us, uh-huh. and we think he's flying northwest. At least, that's the direction he was flying when he was last seen. But we have no proof that he continued on that course indefinitely. He may have doubled back over Mexico. He could have gone in almost any direction. Now, it would be very foolish to start flying with the meager information we have. I guess you're right, Captain. But, gee, I sort of hate to sit here doing nothing. That's where you're wrong, Steve. We aren't idle. We're making preparations for the future. And if my theory is right, Ivan Shark will get in touch with me here. Well, if he does communicate with you... Then I'll be ready to act at once. Now, for that, I've got to have a fast plane. Well, I talked to the Spartan factory a little while ago. Yes? They have a special job ready, which you can have at once. How many passengers? Six. Good. How fast? It's specially streamlined and will do close to 250. All right. I'll take it. Well, do you want to go up and take delivery there? No, Steve. I'd rather stay here on the chance of hearing something from Shark. Well, we'll go up and get it for you. Yes, that's what I'd like to have you do. Steve, uh, can you get the use of the ship? Oh, you bet I can. Fast four passenger cabin jump. Good. Take Senor Paredes' nephew, Pablo, with you and introduce him to Captain Balfour of the Spartan Flying School. Ask uh, Captain Balfour, as a personal favor to me, to see that the boy gets started right. Okay. I'd like to go up with him myself, but Chuck's disappearance has made that impossible. Well, I'll have a talk with Captain Balfour myself, Captain. Oh, good, Major. Now, uh, there's one thing more. Mrs. Donovan has received a very urgent message from her sister at Dallas. 
The sister is very ill, and Mrs. Donovan feels that she should go to her at once. Well, that's easily done. Dallas is almost on our course to Tulsa. Yes, I know that. You can drop Mrs. Donovan off at Dallas and then continue on to Tulsa. What about Patsy? Well, you wouldn't have room for her in the plane anyway, and Mrs. Donovan has consented to let Patsy stay with Steve. Patsy knows Chuck so well that it's quite possible she can be of some real assistance to us in our search for him. <laughs> you bet she can. You know, she's a pretty smart kid, even if she is my sister. <laughs> well, I think we'd better get started at once, then. We ought to get back here just as quickly as we can. Yes. I'd like to have you back here as soon as you can get here. Because no one knows what may happen in the next few hours. Well, come on, Major. Let's get going. Go on. And at the same moment, Ivan Shark's large bimotored plane is taking off from a lonely field over a thousand miles to the northwest. The criminal himself is at the controls, and in the co-pilot seat is his daughter, Fury Shark. Listen as Ivan Shark says, I should like to make one more landing, Fury, before we leave the United States and enter Canada. Then my plans will be complete. I think you are very foolish, Father, to have taken Chuck Ramsey and the boy Crane with us. What possible good can come of it? More good than you have dreamed of, my dear. I tell you that at last, Captain Midnight has played into my hands. He will trouble us no more. Oh, you are getting soft, Father. You are very foolish indeed to accept Captain Midnight's word, even if he should give it to you. Ah, you do not know what you are saying, Fury. Captain Midnight is not like you or me. He has a chaotic idea of something called honor. Once he has given his word, he will not break it. And you really think that in order to get Chuck Ramsey back safely, Captain Midnight will give you his word of honor not to bother you again? That is exactly what I believe, Joey. He would do anything for Chuck Ramsey. But how do you propose to communicate with him? Don't forget, Father, Captain Midnight is no fool. If he can find us and rescue Chuck Ramsey without giving his word of honor, he will do so. I have thought of all that, my dear. After I have made another landing, we will fly to our old hideout in Canada. But I will make it impossible for Captain Midnight to discover the location. And still communicate with him? Most certainly, my dear. It will be very easy. In fact, I relish the days ahead of us very much. Because I will be embarked on a battle of wits between Captain Midnight and myself. But this time, I will hold the advantage once and for all. All I can say is this, my dear father. Do not underestimate Captain Midnight. Have no fear, my dear. I do not underestimate him. But how will you communicate with him without his knowing where we are? I have it all worked out. At our next landing, I will send a telegram to him, sounding him out. This telegram will be sent from some other point far from this part of the country. Through some of our friends, I suppose. Certainly. You can see how easy that will be. Yes. And that will certainly give Captain Midnight no clue to our whereabouts. But how will you have Captain Midnight communicate with you? Ah, my dear, that is the best part. Captain Midnight has a certain wavelength which he always uses. I will tell him to reply to me by radio on that wavelength at certain times. From then on, our communications to each other will always be by radio. And each time I transmit to him... It will be from a different place. Mm, very good, Father. Very good. I will only give him so much time to come to an agreement with me. If he does not give me his word, much as I regret it, Chuck Ramsey and young Crane will have to be liquidated. Yes, Father. And we must not hesitate when the time comes. There shall be no hesitation, my dear. It shall be done and done quickly. Then we will leave for another part of the world. I am very curious, Father, to see how this struggle with Captain Midnight will come out. I do not believe he will make the bargain with you. <laughs> uh, but we shall see. Yes, Gary. We shall see. <laughs> we shall see. Hours have passed, and our scene changes to Ridgeville Airport. It is now late in the evening, and Captain Midnight is talking to Patsy Donovan. A plane has just landed and is taxiing toward them. Let's listen as Patsy says... It is Captain Midnight. I'm sure it is. Yes, it looks like a spot, all right, Patsy. I guess it must be Steve and Major Steele. Isn't it a beauty? Gosh, look at those trim lines. I'll bet it can sure make time. Well, it must have made time to allow Major Steele and Steve to get here this quickly. Why, look, Captain Midnight. I only see one person in the cockpit. Maybe it isn't Steve and Major Steele after all. Oh, well, I'm sure it's a spot, Patsy. It doesn't spot the lines. It's a six-passenger cabin plane. Well, we'll find out in a second. 
It is, Steve. I'm sure it is. But I don't see Major Steele. Yes, that's Steve, all right. I wonder what could have happened to Barry. Hey, Steve. Steve, here we are. Where's Major Steele? Hi there, Patsy. Hello, Captain Midnight. Glad to see you back, Steve. Where's Major Steele? Uh, just a second. I'll be with you. I shut off the gas. I taxied up in the engine. I can't count any second. Right. That's strange. I wonder why Major Steele didn't come back. I wonder if something's gone wrong. No, I don't think so, Patsy. Well, there. Steve will be with us in a second. Yes. Where's Major Steele, Steve? Well, when we got to Tulsa, Major Steele found an important message waiting for him from Washington. Yes? He took the first airliner out of Tulsa, headed east. He said he'd get in touch with you later. Oh, I see. I guess something very important must have come up. Well, it can't be helped. We'll fight this thing through ourselves. Say, have you heard anything from Chuck? No. Not a word, Steve. Then I'm not surprised at that. Undoubtedly, Shark has certain plans. Certain precautionary measures which he has to take. Yes, I guess you're right, Captain. Well, what do you think I better do? Shall I put the Spartan into the hangar? We can't leave it out here very long. No, wait. I, I was just thinking, Steve. I'll tell you what I think Captain we... Albright! Telegram for Captain Albright! Well, listen, do you hear that? Uh... Captain Albright! Telegram for Captain Albright! Say, that's a kid from the airport telegraph office. Hey, kid, here's Captain Albright. Okay. Are you Captain Albright, sir? Oh, yes, I'm Captain Albright. Here you are, sir. Sign here. Oh. There you are, son. Ah, oh, thanks an awful lot, sir. Is it... Is it news of Chuck? Yes. Just as I suspected. It's signed... Ivan Shark. Well, Ivan Shark has made the first move in his battle of wits with Captain Midnight. It's now up to Captain Midnight to make the second. But what will Captain Midnight's move be... Thrilling adventures are ahead. Don't miss them. Tune in to Captain Midnight. See, a few minutes ago, I said that if you wanted to get one of those beautiful big three-color airline maps of the United States, and you were not yet a member of Captain Midnight's 1940 Flight Patrol, that you could join up now and get one anyway. Now, here's how to do that. You just stopped at your Skelly service station with mother or dad when you're out in the family car tonight, tomorrow, or Sunday. Your Skelly man will enroll you as a member and see that you get your Flight Patrol membership card, your spinning Flight Patrol membership medal and pocket piece with the secret password, and he'll give you your big 11 by 17 inch wall map of the airlines of the United States, too. All absolutely free. Remember, it doesn't cost you a cent to join. And everything, including your official airline map, is free. So whether you're already a member or whether you're just joining now, stop at your Skelly service station and get your free airline map of America tonight. And don't forget to tune in again Monday, same time, same station, for further transcribed adventures of Captain Midnight, brought to you by the Skelly Oil Company, Skelly Jobbers and Dealers. So Ivan Shark has actually sent a message to Captain Midnight. What does it say? And will this prove the means whereby Captain Midnight can finally capture Shark and rescue Chuck, be sure to listen Monday. Until then, this is Don Gordon, your Skelly Man, saying goodbye and happy landing! From March 1st, 1940, Captain Midnight. By the way, if you find any Skelly stations, and I don't think there are any left, you're not going to be able to get a map. I think that offer expired a few years ago. Plus, Skelly basically went out of business in 1975. Anyway, uh, visit my webpage, classicradio.stream. That's in full business. Uh, you can find our programs on demand there. You can learn more about building a classic radio collection of your own, and you can contact me classicradio.stream. Don't forget that our shows are also available anywhere podcasts are served, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Amazon. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Please thank this radio station, support their advertisers, and most of all, tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. <laughs>